our purpose is to make electric mobility a global reality. We race in the city. We go green in Beijing. Great start from Nelson Piquet Jr. We just have to take technology to the edge. We need to give the fans what they want. And now they want esports. Reinventing how fans interact with sports. That's me. It's good news for the planet, it's good news for global warming, it's good news for the cities, for the air. I think it is the future. It's fast, it's sexy, it's sleek. I'm pushing the technology of clean energy and battery power forward at tremendous speed. Good evening and welcome to the Zurich e -Pri. Wonderful to have you with us. I'm Hugo Ribatika. Coming up, I talk to my studio guest about Formula E and what it means for the world of sport. Chris of Sports Series Zabida is live at the circuit and he'll bring us all the sights and sounds of Zurich over the course of our build-up to this momentous occasion in motorsport for Switzerland. I mentioned my studio guest and here he is. Most of you will know him for his Formula One knowledge, but today we put Sasha Martinengo to the test on a Formula E. Sasha. Great to have you in the studio. Hugo, fantastic to be here. Thanks very much for the opportunity and, and also looking forward to racing, returning to Zurich and to, to Switzerland uh, per se. Um, it might not be very loud, but it's still going to be racing. It's going to be fabulous. And you can follow me at Hugo Ribatika uh, on Twitter and Instagram and Sasha at F1 Sasha. Tell us a little bit about that. How did you come up with F1 Sasha? Well, I tell you, this brain just works over time, you know, to think of words like that. But now with, you know, we've got F2 that's back, we've got Formula E. Uh, we're going to have to, you know, we just go with F Sasha, but that could be a bit problematic. We'll stick with F1 at the moment. Now, you've obviously been in the business a few years. Yes, I have. And I mean, I love motorsport. So, you know, this is, you know, fourth year going of, of Formula E. So I've watched it uh, carefully um, as it has progressed. So it, it's really interesting to see where it is at the moment and also the fact that there's a lot more interest. For example, I know that Mercedes Benz um, are looking forward to getting into Formula E at the end of this year. Now, apart from the speed of the cars, there are obviously several differences between F1 and Formula E. It is a completely electric uh, series. That, that's what we have to know. They, um, the cars have the exact same aerodynamics, all of the, all of the cars. The teams can, however, um, change the inverters. They can change, they can decide what gearboxes they want to, to use as well. The maximum power is regulated across all of the teams. So they only have 200 kilowatts of power and that is in qualifying form. In race form, they only have 180 kilowatts of power. And they also use two cars. Because the batteries, of course, as they go down, mm. you lose power and then it won't last um, the whole uh, race distance. Now the race so strategy is, is important. So the race is f 50 minutes, yeah. we call it. So at what point would they move to the second car? Well, this is, this is the great part about it. It's, it re you, one would just sit there and say, okay, go flat out for 25 minutes, get into your car. But it's not necessarily that. It all depends on track conditions, how things are going, who who your um, nearest competitor is. So if you're leading the race and your, your competitor, the, the person who's cha challenging you for the title is in 10th position, you really have a significant advantage. But you, you have to use your energy um, efficiently. And I think that's what e you know, electricity and, and Formula E is about. It's not just flat out racing, it's clever racing. I mean, you talk about Formula E, we talk about uh, clean racing. Tell us a little bit about uh, clean racing and obviously the electric uh, powered vehicles that are Formula E. I think if, if we look at just the world in general, Hugo, uh, the world needs a change in everything. And, and one of them is efficiency and um, uh, power saving and uh, you know, better, t better technology when it comes to uh, the air that we breathe and, and how we live our lives. So maybe the, the days of everything just being petroleum or, or diesel are beginning to fade out and the, the you know, more efficient um, electric um, power will be coming back into us. Listen, electricity is not new. You know, we've had electric cars back in the 1930s already as well. So, you know, at that time it wasn't right, but now it is and the world needs to embrace it. Um, it's got a long way to go, but it, uh, but it is a start. Now, all for you, we talked about uh, electricity. 
and obviously when you're driving a normally uh, powered car, you know, you, you step on it and then it might take a little bit to, to respond. Mm. The electric car? Well, electric, I mean, it, it's like a, a, a light switch. You turn it on, the light's immediate, it goes, and you turn it off, it, it goes away. So that's what, you know, elect a, a standard electric car would do is just go on and off. But because they've got these inverters and, and, and they develop their own motors, they can uh, adjust the 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 gas pedal mm. for the want of a better word so they can actually ride it as opposed to just being on and off uh, all of the time and speed we look at what uh, 250 260 k's now yeah right about 230 kilometers and that is governed they want it for safety don't forget 99 percent of the tracks that they race in formula R e are on street circuits for example in zurich and, mm. and um, just from a safety point of view just uh, restrict it uh, in terms of its uh, speed N now obviously each track or each circuit, because the street circuit is vastly different uh, from from the next. Uh, does this pose any challenges for the drivers? Oh, very much so. I mean, a street circuit, if, if we look at Formula One, we race in, in Monaco, we race in Singapore, um, but in, in Formula E, you, you're racing in all of these newly made circuits. They're very, very different. Um, and racing in a street circuit is very dif difficult. You don't have runoff areas. So, I mean, if you do understeer or oversteer into a corner, the chances of you hitting a wall are very, very easy. This track, there's no curbs, for example. So it does make it a little bit easier. So you, you don't get the car too unbalanced. But um, it's still, um, it, driving any street circuit is a massive challenge. Okay, now we must talk about uh, this race, the first in uh, six decades in uh, Switzerland. A little bit of background to that. Yes, um, you know, in 1955, there was a horrific accident at Le Mans um, involving Mercedes. And uh, it's just a horrific, horrific moment in motorsport history. A lot of people were killed. And, and Switzerland took um, the decision that that was it. They're, they're not going to allow any kind of uh, motorsport in, in their country. And 68 years later, um, they have changed the law. And mm -hmm. that's what you have to do. You have to change the law of a government. But they've only allowed it for Formula E. So you can't now, now we're all going, oh, let's, let's go and do some motor racing in Switzerland. No, they're only having it for Formula E and also because it's a fresh technology. It's very kind to the environment. And that's what they want to do. But I think it's great to have it back in, in Switzerland. You know, it's such a beautiful country and, and Zurich is such a beautiful city as well. Yes, and as we, we are going to speak to our man, you in a little while, but your thoughts on the atmosphere right now uh, out in Zurich, you know, first time having this sort of race in, in many lifetimes, in fact. Very much so. I mean, it's 70, 68 years, you know, it's two generations of families. I, I think it must be incredible. I know the weather's very, very warm. They're into summer uh, in, in Europe. It's a beautiful city. The sun is going to be shining. There was some talk of rain and hopefully that doesn't come. But either way, it's still going to be fun. And you've got all these people in, in you know, people living cities. So they're going to be standing you know looking out their windows on on their patios uh, watching um, cars making very strange noises go around their city so I think it's it's quite exciting yeah we speak about the sound we speak about the noise uh, they I was reading up somewhere that it says that uh, the sound that a Formula E car makes is uh, 10 decibels more than an ordinary car. But that in no way compares to uh, an F1 car. No, uh, and to any other kind of motor racing car. Let, let's, let's be honest, it's an electric car. So, I mean, it sounds like a, a vacuum cleaner, let, let's be honest. But they're very, very fast vacuum cleaners, that's for sure. And they, they are very efficient cars. They're very clever. The formula, the race formula is also very, very clever because you can damage your vehicle and think that you're five or six laps down, but you still have a chance to score points in terms of fastest laps so you can change the error of the car. Um, but that's the only time. So it's, it's a very clever formula. It doesn't mean that you, if you crashed out, that's the end of your race. You can still get into the race. Now we are going to take a look at uh, some of the top drivers that are participating in the Formula E at the, the moment. Uh, anyone you in particular that you'd like to highlight? Well, I, there's so many, you know, look, look at that list on, on the screen. These are mainly all have had something to do with Formula One. Nelson Piquet, of course, raced. He had a couple of podiums. Nick Heidfeld, most probably the most successful from the Formula One. Lots of podiums, over 250 odd points. Buemi raced for Force India. Lotter has raced there. D'Ambrosio has raced. The others have all been uh, test drivers. Lucas de Grassi raced there as well. So, um, and jean eric Verne, I don't see his name up there, but jean eric Verne also, and he's leading the Formula E championship at the moment. So he's the man who can win this championship from Sam Bird is on the screen whose who's final role in Formula One was a test driver for Mercedes. So uh, those are the guys, these are guys to watch. But John eric Verne is going to be starting way down the pack, Sam Bird right up. So the championship is very much alive. Okay, so obviously you've got guys like Verne, 
Bird, uh, Rosenquist that are out there in, in the mix, uh, and a couple of locals in there as well. Yeah, we do. Sebastian Buemi, of course, is a is a local from Switzerland. Morna, um, Mortara as well. Eduardo Mo, uh, Mortara, also the um, Swiss uh, favourite. But Buemi, I think, got a little bit of pressure on him. But it should be really, really exciting for him. It's a home race. I mean, you know, if you look at uh, the Swiss drivers over the years, you know, you only think of Mark Schurer and and um, Clay Regazzoni. Mm. But Sebastian Buemi has um, held his high very, very well. He is the ch current champion as well. So he, there's a great fight for third. Rosenquist, Apt, um, Buemi and, and Lucas de Grassi. So watch those four really battle it out hard. Now we talk about uh, F1 drivers that are now in uh, Formula E. And uh, Euro Zabata is with Felipe Massa. Quest Sports, uh, wanted to find out how excited you are for starting in Formula E, transitioning from Formula One. How does it seem? the difference in driving technique from one to the other yeah so definitely is a big is a, is a big difference you know from the cars from the championship also the tracks even if uh, formula one they race in monaco they race in singapore but i mean the tracks a lot different style you know and uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge you know you need to learn how to drive so the way of uh, understanding the battery the the, the brakes uh, also, the car, you know, the, that is, is a car that has a completely different aerodynamic compared to Formula One in terms of downforce. So it is definitely a big challenge, but I'm really looking forward to to learn everything as as quick as I can and uh, and uh, you know try to enjoy uh, the second phase of my career in Formula E. I'm sure it's going to be good physically. Tell me the challenging aspect of your physicality. Do you think Formula One, Formula E? very different yeah, what kind of training what have you changed yeah it's very different for sure i keep training i think it's important that you keep you know uh, uh, training and you are in the good shape but it's true that um, physically the formula one has a lot more g-force so for your heart uh, also for the you know the amount of uh, uh, g-force and power you put on your on neck your on your shoulder is a lot stronger than anything else uh, formula e the steering wheel is heavier you know than formula one so you need to train a little bit more muscles for your arms but a part of that is, is not a problem. I've seen on your Instagram training in Brazil. I think you're perfectly fine and you'll do just great. Thank you very much, Felipe. You keep well. So Felipe talks about a uh, little bit more muscle. You've got to have those guns. Uh, now, what would cause that difference? Well, I think because you're on street circuits all of the time, so you've got so many more corners than, than a traditional um, racing circuit. And most of the time, it's, it's uh, sort of, fast bursts and then quick turns. So you're into a lot of chicane. So that's what's going to uh, make you use your upper body. But for, for the rest, in terms of the, the Formula One downforce compared to, to this, will be quite significant. But, you know, driving any form of racing car and any form of motorsport is incredibly challenging. So, you know, don't, don't look at it and say, well, because they don't make a noise, they, uh, they're not challenging. These are top, top drivers uh, racing in this category. Well, a man here is a bider, is uh, having all the fun, and he's out at the Jaguar Garage, and we join him now. Yuri, how's it going? Thank you, Hugo and Sasha. We are here at this buzzing atmosphere where 60-odd years of deprived Swiss environment in terms of motor racing, they haven't seen any for 60 years. Well, now it's here, and now it's happening. Ypri in Zurich is becoming the biggest buzz that's happening in this city. Today we've seen high temperatures, we've seen everything from cars that have bumped into the walls due to not braking right, cars are getting into the right temperature with their tires, batteries overheating, dry ice being thrown, conversations with mechanics, but most importantly is that this huge atmosphere here is buzzing. Formula E is definitely growing and at this final pre-final uh, race. The next one is a double header in New York. Everything is for grabs. What happens today is that Super Bowl, uh, a team that we were not expecting at all, the team, standing, the team we're standing in front of, the team behind me, Jaguar Racing, which is currently fifth in the constructors, uh, came out on top their maiden pole position. Mitch Evans, the New Zealand uh, driver, he ended up performing perfectly flawless around the circuit, had no mistakes, no errors, and made sure that on this difficult surface, on this difficult tarmac, where you have tram lines, you must remember tram lines, you have a big impact. 
We know that the tires are all weather tires, not like in Formula One. These are tires that completely can be used in rain, can be used in dry, but you still have to get them into the operating window. And the team behind us here is the team that managed to do that. Not only they were flawless in terms of making sure, taking wider lines, Mitch Evans came out of nowhere. Jean-Eric Verne, which is currently leading uh, the drivers, and Tachita, which is his team driving uh, for, which he's driving for, have completely failed at this. Only, only driver that actually kept up for them was Andre Lotterer, which later we'll be seeing on the grid. We'll be seeing how they have managed to get that right, but everybody else here is on the same equal foot. We look at a team that, or, or teams that have not, no experience of the track, have no knowledge of things out here in Zurich. We've got cobblestone uh, pit lane. We've got a green uh, wooden uh, pit lane. Uh, we, uh, pit stops, may say, pit boxes. And this has turned to be more exciting than anything. The fact that it's a sustainable sport, you will hear from our interview with uh, the CEO of Formula E, Alejandro uh, Agag. He is the gentleman that will define the future of this Grand Prix year over the next nine years. Looking into it, a fantastic race, unpredictable. You can't see who's going to win, but right now, Jerome D'Ambrosio, Jaguar are making it happen. And this is where we want it to go. Throwing it back to you in the studio, Hugo, Sasha, chat to you in a bit. Thanks, uh, Yuri. Now, let's, let's talk about how who's atop the grid uh, started this race. Well, I mean, that's amazing. Earlier on, uh, Mitch Evans, that he said, is right up there. And I had a D'Ambrosio a second. Um, and it, I'm looking at the time sheets. I don't know if there's been a change somewhere along the line, if there's been a penalty. But I see Lotter a second. But Hugo, this is where it's very interesting, because he mentioned jean eric Verne. Verne's leading the championship. Bird is second. So Bird is in the top five. Verne is all the way down in 17th. But Lotter is his teammate. So now you've got to believe that the team, Lotterer and, and Verne, are talking strategy of mm. how Lotterer is going to help Jean-Éric Verne. Now, what would that strategy be? Well, the main thing is to keep Sam Bird behind him. But, um, or, or race, as, you know, it's, a, it's amazing. You, he's going to try and race as slowly as possible um, to make sure that the fee, fee, field is bunched up and to allow Verne, hopefully, the opportunities to actually get past as many drivers as, as possible. It is part of, um, you know, what, what teams uh, teams do. Now let's, let's talk about the points awarded. Now, Vern, I think, is uh, 40, 40, odd points, points, yeah. uh, 40 points ahead of, uh, of Bird. So if he loses this race, if he doesn't make a podium finish, how many points does he lose? And what does the winner get? Well, the winner gets 25 points. But pole person, which we now know is uh, Mitch Evans, he gets the three extra points, and there's one extra point for um, faster slap. Mm -hmm. So if Sam Bird, for example, had to win the slap, and, and, and John eric Verne, there we go, it is 40 points. So if, if Bird had to win today and get faster slap, and John eric Verne get nothing, all of a sudden it's 26 points. So they're going to the final weekend um, in New York uh, when, when that comes with two races to go with only 14 points. They only score the top 10 points, uh, 10 drivers. So Vern has to get from 17th. He's got to get into the points somewhere along the line. Bird is just wants to try and take as many points away as possible. Lotterer is going to try and keep Bird behind him and, and get... Try and, try and get people to get past uh, Sam Bird. Now, we are going to have a chat a little bit later on about the circuit, but how possible is it for him to move to from 17 into a points position? Very possible. And also, in, in um, uh, street circuit racing, it's always uh, very, very complicated. A lot of crashes happen. The great thing that I love about Formula E is when they start, they don't do a warm-up lap, mm. they don't have the opportunity to get any heat into the tyres or into the brakes. So it is a flat-out run. It's a long run to turn one here in yeah. Zurich. It's a right-hander. There's going to be fun and games. And if you're uh, a, an astute and clever driver, Werner could make up six, seven places. But he could also get tangled. So it's going to be very unpredictable. Well, let's talk about how wide those, uh, that street circuit is and obviously uh, how much it impacts uh, who's at the top of the grid and who can make their way in that uh, opening stage. Well... <laughs> It's, it's quite an incredible. Racing drivers will all be sitting with their team managers. And, and let's say I'm, I'm your team manager and you're the mm -hmm. racing driver. And I say, Hugo, listen, when we get out down there, make sure you stick to the left-hand side of the circuit. When you get to your braking point, hit your brakes a little bit earlier because they're going to be sore, they're going to, they're going to be cold. And then I want you to turn in. And you say, Sasha, perfect. As soon as your, your visor goes down, you forget all of that. <laughs> and it's just now racing. So there's only, there's only one line in racing. But they're all going to try and squeeze. You want to try and make up positions, especially on street circuits. It is very difficult. And I know they do have other elements like fan boost, and we'll talk that a, a little bit later. And they do have to swap cars. So there, there are chances that you can lose a lot of time. But 
always remember this, you can't win a race on the first corner, but you can lose a race on the first corner. So they're very aware of this. This is all about the championship. Now, Yuri did talk a little bit about some of the challenges that uh, the drivers can look forward to or can expect, and one of those is batteries. Yes, the battery is very interesting because they all have the same power um, available to them, and that is the, um, the 180 kilowatts of, of power. Um, but if you, if you drive a car too slowly, um, the batteries can overheat. Now, I'm no huge fundy when it comes to, to batteries, but mm. this is what I understand. If you drive it too conservatively and try and save too much energy in the battery, also under braking, you can regenerate the battery, but it can actually cause the battery to overheat. So they're very mindful and they're told by their teams all of the time what they have to do in terms of battery power. Well, a man Yuri is certainly working for his money, and right now he speaks to the CEO of Formula E. We're here today with Mr. Alessandro Agaga, CEO, and uh, wanting to ask him a few questions regarding uh, the E Grand Prix for Zurich, specific, and a little bit more of the future. Yeah. Mr. Agaga, please can you explain to us how difficult was it and what were the challenges you had in going forward here? Well, the main challenge was that racing was forbidden in Switzerland for decades, so we had to change the law of this country to be able to race. And they accepted to change the law only for Formula E, for electric racing, because of the sustainability angle. So it was great. We, once we did that, it was all downhill, and we, here we are in Zurich. Fantastic job, it's best, best I've seen so far. In terms of your future, Gen 2, the batteries, the strategy, the cars actually making the complete race and still being fast, what have you guys got in mind? So we have now this new format that we're going to do, almost like a Super Mario Kart, where there are two levels of energy, and the cars where they go through a special corner, they get the attack mode, and the drivers can choose when they want to go on that mode. I think that would be pretty cool because the new cars can do the whole race on one go, so there's no more pit stop. So I think the race is going to be very, very exciting. Fantastic. And in terms of uh, future for Africa, we're looking at a race uh, in another country apart from Morocco. We know we do have uh, yeah. the Ypres there. What are your plans? Do you have anything in mind or is this an open opportunity for us? No, it's an open opportunity. Obviously, we have a few conversations going, but, you know, if we find a good candidate city, we'd love to come. And, you know, South Africa, for example, has had many races, Formula One, A1 in Durban, I remember, with a street track. So, you know, why not? Most welcome, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Everybody's very, very excited about uh, that race happening out in, uh, in, in Zurich. Oh, very much so. As you know, 60-odd years we, we've been waiting for it to come. Plus, we've got two local boys and, and the one, Sebastian Buemi, who's the current champion of, of Formula E. So I think that it, it really is a, 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 an iconic day for, for Switzerland and for Zurich and, and something very, very special in the world of Formula E. So, you know, well done to everybody to have made this happen. Yeah, so we've got two of the locals, uh, Matara and uh, Buemi. Yeah. Their chances? Well, Buemi, definitely. Uh, Motara, I think, is, is decent. But Buemi is the current champion. He's going to be starting, I think, sixth or seventh on, on the grid. Watch out for him. He's a, he's a fantastic racing driver. I, I still, to this day, don't believe he had enough chance in the world of, of Formula One. I really, really rate the guy as a great driver. He's shown it by being the, the champion here. And, you know, in front of his, his home crowd, uh, he'll, he'll want to try and do his best. Does that give uh, the locals any advantage? I mean, we look at the last two races, and the last two races have been won uh, by locals of their respective countries. I think, you know, as a local driver, you are always going to feel a little bit more electrified by it. And maybe you know the streets a little bit better than everybody else. But I remember in the days of, of Nigel Mansell racing in Formula One, he always said when he raced in England, he just felt he had an extra tenth or two tenths uh, that, he could, that he could fire. So Buemi's not on pole, but he's right up there and expect a challenge not, from Not him. pressure on the contrary, that everybody's watching you, 100,000 fans possibly that are rooting for you. I think spot on there as well. There is that added pressure. And, you know, we have unfortunately seen in many, many forms of motor racing that, that the locals start off and, and crash out in the first corner. Let's hope that doesn't happen for Buemi or Montaro today. OK, well, let's see if uh, that home favourite, Sebastian Buemi, uh, will have a chance today. There's so, so many other Swiss drivers that never had the opportunity to race in the home country and uh, I would be one of the, the few ones to, to get the, the chance. I, I can't believe it. It's, it's difficult to describe. It's, it's been an amazing feeling. You know, I've been on those roads with a normal car in the past and to be there with the Formula E car is difficult to believe. Formula E has always been able to bring the championship, the races in places where we could not even dream of it. I think because we race in city centers, because we are electric, because we are the future, 
the cities are kind of more open to, to host a race. You know, I, I can't wait for, for the race to, to happen. He can't wait, neither can we. So obviously lots of excitement uh, coming from uh, Sebastian uh, Buemi. Now, an exciting part is uh, Fan Boost. Yeah, it's quite controversial. Um, just, to, just to explain, you know, when it first came out, I think people sat there and went, what have they got extra fans? But no, it's a social media initiative. Very clever. It's the way to get um, you know people engaged with the drivers. And if you're a great social media person in terms of a driver and you've got a good marketing team around you, you try and get votes. All right, and everybody can vote up until uh, you can vote every day until race day, and you can actually vote for the first six minutes of uh, while the race is starting for your favorite driver. Then a percentage is calculated, and then that driver has something called a fan boost, and they are now allowed to use what um, an extra 100 kilojoules of power, which I think is 10 kilowatts. So if you're coming down the straight and you're battling to pass somebody else and you've got the fan boost, you can push it. And we saw it with Lucas Degrassi. Lucas Degrassi won um, uh, the championship by using fan boost, by going past, I think it was Jerome D'Ambrosio last year or the year before. Now, interestingly, not everybody can benefit from the fan boost. So if you're number 15, for instance. Yeah, well, it just shows you not a lot of people like you, unfortunately. So it's only the, f the top guys who, who actually get it. Um, it. As I say, it's quite controversial. But because the tracks are on, on, on street circuits, I think it's a great initiative because overtaking is naturally very, very difficult. Now you talk about... Uh, 10 kilowatts extra. Now, how much in, in real terms does that actually give you? Is yeah. it a huge advantage? Yes, it's a huge advantage, especially if, if your maximum is only 180. Um, you know, 10% 10, 10 of that is, uh, is 18. So, I mean, it's about 7 or 8% more power. Um, it, it's, it's very significant. Okay, so we're going to have a look right now at how the fan boost actually works. Formula E is the only event in the world that let fans play an active role in influencing the outcome of the race. Pushes the fan boost. Fan boost gives fans the opportunity to vote for their favorite driver and award them an extra boost of power during the race. Lucas, we have fan boost. Degrassi uses his fan boost. The three drivers with the most fan boost votes are awarded a significant burst of power, which they can deploy in a five second window during the second half of the race. You can vote to fan boost your favorite driver in the six days prior to and up to six minutes into each race. You can do this via the Formula E website and social media. Obviously very, very exciting that you can have that added element and the, the involvement of, of the fans. Do you, do you see it as a, as a practical aspect to increasing uh, support for Formula E? Well, I, I think the, the great thing about it is, is the whole world, is, is when it comes to motorsport, is so focused on Formula One and we only always think of the Formula One drivers. Now all of a sudden you've got another series where you've got all of these other drivers and they have the opportunity to also become um, superstars. You know, not everyone has to be a Lewis Hamilton. You can have a Sebastian Buemi or Jean-Éric Verne. And if they're very good in their marketing, all of a sudden that extra 10 kilowatts of power that they get in a race can be the difference of winning a championship and losing a championship. And no matter what formula, if you're a winner, you're a winner and people will remember who you are. So obviously it'll be integral for somebody like Sebastian Verne, if he, uh, for Verne rather. So if yeah. he comes way down uh, in the standings and he gets that boost, then that could be quite positive for him. Very, very much so. And I'm sure he's working like crazy at the moment um, to try and get as many fans as possible. Because I think at the moment leading is Degrassi, Buemi and Rosenquist. So if Verne wants to get there, he's got to be in that top three to have any, any kind of chance. It is a Formula E weekend out in uh, Zurich. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Here with Lucas Degrassi, getting ready for, a, he scored the fastest time in the first practice. So uh, getting ready now for his uh, race. How does it look for your chances on this Grand Prix, on this Ypres? Uh, yeah, um, the, the chances I think is, is pretty good. The car is good. We're fast. But in Formula you never know. We have qualifying in one hour and then, uh, and then from there we decide the strategy. I think you're the best in that aspect. Huh? So <laughs> we'll give you the chance on that. Uh, in terms of uh, New York, what are you looking at? Uh, yeah, I think the, what we can aim for is the top three in the championship. Um, that's what we're going to try to get. Thank you very much, Lucas. Thank Appreciate you. it. Obrigado.
there are many places around the track that have different tarmac. Uh, some are concrete, some are like this in the pit lane, some are different, some are really bumpy. We decided to design a very unique tire dedicated to this idea of energy efficiency. What's very specific is that we use the same tire for the rain and for uh, dry conditions. Uh, it makes it uh, just a little bit more special. You have to imagine that when a car is running, the ring resistance of the tire represents 20% of the overall energy uh, need of a car. So it's uh, very important to minimize it as much as possible. Motorsport is clearly used as a laboratory. We are involved in a championship that makes sense for the development of our street tires. We uh, designed an 18 inch tire for uh, that type of cars, which is quite a revolution because you have smaller uh, sidewalls, that means you have less deflection and then you have less rolling resistance. With low speed, because it's a city track, aerodynamic effect on the grip is very low. That means we have to maximize the grip coming from the tire. And we introduced the Pilot Sport EV2 for the season three, where we improved the weight reduction of about 2,500 kilograms and transport a very small quantities of tire, which is a very a huge benefit uh, regarding the environmental footprint of the championship. I think every decisions that are made around Formula E are uh, something to try and replicate also in the reality. And I think for a manufacturer to come in the championship it's quite important to make the link so that the clients when they come in the shop they say look we got a, a racing car competing in the world. More or less the same tyres, more or less the same powertrain, more or less the same maps that are going to be used in, uh, in real car for regenerating the energy. And uh, you know we win those races and uh, you have the same technology in your, in your car. It's every weekend in Zurich, Switzerland, and it's the first time in over 60 years that they've had a race of this magnitude. And I have uh, Sasha with me in the studio, and we are talking tyres, Sasha. What is the difference, main difference between tyres in e pre and in F1? Well, two main differences is uh, the size of the tyres and, of course, the compounds. So Michelin uh, supplies e um, Grand Prix racing and it is uh, what you call a treaded tyre, a, a, a tyre that we use on normal road cars developed specifically for this kind of racing. So it's an all-weather tyre, it's mm -hmm. used in wet and dry conditions. In Formula One um, they have um, slick tyres, then they have intermediate tyres and full wet tyres. So a much more um, advanced um, and uh, technically complex kind of tyres opposed to, to Formula E. But Formula E is about efficiency. So, mm. you know, rather, as opposed to everyone changing tyres all, all of the time, they're trying to make it cost effective as well. Also, the Formula E is a much smaller sidewall, so it's an 18-inch uh, rim, whereas in Formula 1 it's a 13-inch inch rim. Which is quite a It's difference. a massive difference. So the sidewall in, um, in a Formula 1 tyre is much bigger. All right, so there's a lot of um, uh, leverage in terms of the suspension of the actual tyre. Um, whereas is it in, also this because of the circuit that they race on? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I, I think it's just from a grip point of view that that's what they do in, in Formula One. They find it a little bit more efficient um, and um, uh, grippier mm. as opposed to a bigger tire, although they are looking at going to 18 inch um, in the future. Whereas with the Formula E tire, it's a, a lot more um, harder in terms of its compound because of the very th um, small sidewall. I mean, if that thing pops, it's, it's going to pop uh, quite, quite big. You, you talk about tires popping, and that is uh, potentially one of the only times that you can actually change tires if your tire uh, pops. Yeah, that's in, in Formula E, that's the only time you're allowed to change tires, so your tires have to last you the, the whole of the Grand Prix. But there's one significant difference here in, in, formula, in this formula. Um, in, in any kind of racing like Formula One, for example, they have fuel loads. So the cars get lighter mm. and then the, then the tyres affect or, or, or re respond differently. In Formula E, there's no weight difference. The <laughs> weight is exactly the same. It's only a battery power that goes down. So the tyre um, difference is not uh, that, that um, significant. Okay, and, and the race, the, the circuit is what, uh, two and a half k's? Yeah, I think this one is roughly two and a half kilometres uh, long. And as they say, they run for 50 minutes. 
and they have to use two cars. So they have to decide. There is a, a look at 2.4 uh, kilometers, so it's a spot on the money. And then somewhere along the line, they've got to decide in terms of their strategy, when do they get into their other car and then how fast they do the first segment of the, of the race, how fast they do the second segment of the race. And all of these will be worked out, Hugo, together with their strategists in terms of if there are safety car interventions as well. Uh, we, we take a look at that, so we look at your safety, safety car areas. Does the safety car operate in the same way that it does in F1? I must be honest, that I'm not entirely sure of, but I don't think it'll be too dissimilar. I mean, a safety car is there for a specific reason, so I don't see it being too different. Yeah, so obviously exciting things happening. Yes. We are going right. to take a look at the virtual circuit. Here we are on the shores of Lake Zurich. Let's go for a lap of the ABB Formula E track. Down the long, bumpy straight into Turn 1 at Arboretum Park, crossing a bump over the apex and then some tram tracks, which you then have to cross again as you turn left at Rotterschloss. Very smooth part of the track now through Stockerstrasse. The corners are just far enough away here that you cannot get into a rhythm. Left at Palme, right at Bank. Again, still very smooth surface. Get as close to the walls as you possibly can. Left at Enga. Fast entry into the tram stop. So important to get a good exit here because the straight afterwards is incredibly long. As you're heading down, all you're now focusing on is the breaking point to the last corner at the hairpin. Too early, you're gonna leave time on the table. Too late, you're gonna end up down the escape road. Corner exit, again, so important. You're turning and accelerating and the track falls away from you. Pit entry on your right as you cross over the bumps and over the start finish line. A lot of sharp turns is the one thing that I picked up there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a street circuit, you know, and Felipe Massa spoke about how it really moves your arms. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, driving there as well. No curbs, as I mentioned earlier, um, but it's, v it's very, very bumpy. You know, for those who maybe haven't seen any of the free practice or the qualifying, when, when it comes to racing, you'll see there's a long straight, that's incredibly bumpy. So, I mean, mm -hmm. they have to deal with manhole covers, the traditional things that are on a normal circuit. But also here in Zurich, I mean, that city revolves around so many trams. So they've got these tram lines all over the place. So, I mean, you know, a, a tire gets onto, onto that and all of a sudden you don't have the, 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 the traction and the grip to get going. So you, in the short period of time that they've learned this track, the drivers have done an exceptional job. I mean, it just shows you how, you know, they're top class. So coming back again to some of the attributes uh, that a driver needs, obviously uh, Felipe Massa talked about, you know, you got to have the guns, you've got to be a little bit stronger. Anything else that a Formula E driver has got to have to have an advantage on this sort of circuit? Well, it's everything in, in motor racing is just about focus. And, and um, you know, if something does go wrong, you've got to be able to, to control yourself and, and, and ensure that, hey, don't, you know, you can lose it in the first corner. You can't necessarily win it in the first corner. So just make sure that you get through that first corner. Thereafter, you can go racing. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, some of the other races that are on the circuit. We've got Hong Kong, uh, Marrakesh, and they've already raced. What's happening after uh, Zurich? Well, this is the second last event because they go to New York, I think, in about three weeks or four weeks from now. And then they have two races there. They have a, I think it's a Saturday and a Sunday, mm -hmm. um, two events in New York. So that's going to make a, a big difference. So at the moment, they're 50, uh, 54, 55 points up for grabs um, for the top two drivers. Okay, so we did talk a little bit earlier about uh, the fan boost. We're now going to take a look at the updated fan boost and see who's got all the votes. Let's have a look in the fan boost standings. Fan boost voting is still open. If you're not sure what fan boost is, it's an opportunity for fans to give their favorite driver a 160 horsepower boost in the second of the two cars they will use in today's race. Leading the voting right now, Daniel Apt, Sebastian Buemi, and Lucas Degrassi. By the percentages you see, Felix Rosenquist with the Mander team. Still time to give him your fan boost vote. Go to FIAformulae.com slash fan boost, vote on the internet, or on Twitter using hashtag fan boost plus hashtag driver's full name, and help your favorite driver out. Now the track is tight and twisty, passing likely to be at a premium, and that made qualifying all important. So at Buemi and De Grossi, and they're leading with the 19 and 18 and 18 percent. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing. I mean, uh, Lucas De Grassi is the current champion, and Sebastian Buemi uh, the champion before. So just shows you winning a title 
look how, how uh, popular they are. Daniel Apt, of course, uh, the app name is so mm -hmm. synonymous when it comes to, to motorsport. So we expect him to be up there. But if you look in position 6th and 7th, that's where you've got Johnny McVern and that's where you've got um, Sam Bird, the two protagonists for the title. So they'll be really pushing at the moment. Um, and as I said, in the first six minutes of the race, people can still add. They've got a long way to go because they're, you know, the five or six mm. percent. But only one of them has to get in the top three, and they've got that um, fan boost option. F1 Sasha, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Right now, we would, we would have expected, or certainly I would have expected, that a guy like Felipe Massa, who's been in the game a long time, would be up there. Now, he's not. He's on one percent. Th does this mean then that there isn't a, a cross-pollination between... Uh, Formula E uh, fans and, and F1 fans. All right, so I'm, I'm just trying to get because we've got we've got the Felipe Massa who's he's only going to race next year. So let's just see which Felipe they had down at the bottom there because he's not racing today. No, no, he's not. Um, but uh, listen, all of the guys at the bottom. I mean, I saw somebody who was right at the bottom, zero percent, Nicholas Prost. You know, and you're going with a Prost name. I mean, that's just crazy. He should he should really be up there. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, how, how this works, I'm not entirely so sure. So is the typical uh, E fan not a Formula One fan? No, I think, I think motorsport fans are motorsport fans. You, you will always get the two-wheel two brigade against the four-wheel brigade. Um, and then you're going to get people who hate Formula One and you're going to get people who hate Formula E. But until you understand the dynamics of any of these formula, it's quite a naive comment to make to sit there, oh, I can't stand Formula One, oh, it's a procession, or Formula E, they don't make any noise, they're too slow. Watch it, and then try and understand it. Once you get an understanding of any form of motorsport, and, and whether it's kids going around in go-karts or, um, you know, a regional championship of old, you know, VW Golf Ones, there's a reason and there's a methodology in all of it. So, uh, I think motorsport fans all are, are motorsport fans. They, they just try and be too cool. Now we're a few minutes away before the start of the race. Uh, your thoughts or who is your money on? Well, you know, if I look at um, Mitch Evans, it is his first um, pole position. So I don't know if he's got it in him to, 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 to lead from the front, but it's fantastic, I think, for the sport. He's a young New Zealander and, and he's got, got all of the opportunities. The way that I've seen it is Andre Lotter is now in second. I saw D'Ambrosio up there in second earlier on, so somewhere along the line, we're waiting for the uh, final grid to come to us. Lotterer, D'Ambrosio, these are the guys that you, you really have to watch. But further down, Sam Bird's going to try and get up there. And Vern either has to play it very, very conservatively initially mm. just to get through the mayhem of turn one especially when you're in the midfield and then from there hopefully try and make a strategic call maybe you know push as hard as he can and then get into his second car as quickly as possible. I know that and, and if one strategy is a big part of it what are some of the strategies the drivers are likely to employ i.e the guy who's number 17 Vern and the guy who's at the top well, the cars can only last a certain amount of time. You know, if flat out, they can only last 25 minutes each. So if he's, if this, the, the um, you know, at the moment they're doing qualifying at one minute 12s, if the pace of the race is a lot slower, then it means that that energy in that, that battery is going to last a lot, a lot longer. So, and if they all bunched up and very, very close to each other, you're going to see a, a bun fight for all of them going into the pits roughly at, at the same time. For a guy like Jean-Éric Verne, he's got to try and make up as many positions as possible, which means he's going to expend a lot more energy. And then there afterwards, maybe he sits and, and, and takes a gamble and, and goes in earlier than the others and changes cars. Well, we talk about the grid, let's take a look at qualifying. Qualifying on the streets of Zurich took place earlier on today, and the top five in the championship were all out in the first group. Jean-Eric Verne, championship leader, could only manage fifth quickest and a shake of the head which got even more pronounced when Sam Bird, his title rival, was quickest of anyone in the first part of qualifying. There was an impressive performance from Mitch Evans. He was the fastest of all the group runners. Jean-Eric Verne out of Super Pole. Sam Bird was the first man out in the pole position shootout, but a mistake at the chicane brushing the wall cost him a lot of lap time. Still came across the line though to set a 1 minute 13.0, which was a competitive time. Next up, Andre Lotterer. Jean-Eric Verne's teammate in the Tachita car put in a very impressive performance to go quicker than Bird and take provisional pole position. Next up, Jose Maria Lopez for Dragon. He overdid it. Getting right up towards the barriers on the exit of turn one, he was slower than anyone else.
but his teammate was next up, Jerome D'Ambrosio, and a solid lap put him third quickest. So it would be Lotterer or Mitch Evans for pole position. Both of them looking for their first ever poles in Formula E, but it was Evans who secured it. Yes! Yes! <laughs> His first pole, Jaguar's first pole, and delight. I mean, it's a long time coming for us. It's, uh, yeah, it's, we've been very, very close in other, other races, but, uh, yeah, we've been quick out of the box today, and, and it was, I knew it was a good opportunity for us to get that first pole position. So to convert that is, is such a great feeling, and, Super proud of everyone at, at Jaguar, and uh, obviously it's the first pole since we, you know, since Jaguar's come back into motorsport, and, and our, our first in this uh, in this new program. So uh, super happy, and hopefully we can uh, have a good race and then convert that into a win. So Evans and Jaguar taking their first ever pole position. Lotta are alongside him on the front row. Sam Bird there or thereabouts in third place. The Dragons with a great performance in fourth and fifth, with home hero Buemi down in seventh spot. But the championship leader Jean Eric Verne could only manage 17th quickest. He has got a lot of work to do if he's going to take a decent amount of points from the Zurich E Prix this afternoon. And so the Julius Bear pole position and its three championship bonus points went not to one of the title contenders, but to Mitch Evans, who's in a position battle of his own, seventh of the championship. From back to front, here's how they'll line up on row 10. Oliver Turvey outside, Neo teammate Luca Filippi inside. Ahead of them, Mauro Engel for Venturi and Jean-Eric Verne, the points leader, 14 places below his seasonal average qualifying. Stefan Sarazan and Alex Lynn will be on the next row. Antonio Felix da Costa outside, Eduardo Mortara inside. Moving up, Nick Heitfeld and Nelson Piquet for Panasonic Jaguar. We'll be following Felix Rosenquist from Mahindra and Daniel Abb, winner of our most recent race on home soil in Germany, in Berlin. Jose Maria Lopez will take a three grid spot penalty for failing to slow sufficiently under a yellow flag during practice. Nico Prost will be to his inside. Sebastian Buemi and Lucas Degrassi just ahead of them. And in our front two rows, Jerome D'Ambrosio with a brilliant qualifying performance for the Dragon team. Sam Bird to his left has a golden opportunity to make up ground in the championship up ahead. Two first-timers on the front row, Andre Lotterer, his first career front row start, and Mitch Evans with his and the Panasonic Jaguar Racing Team's first ABB Formula E pole position. So congratulations to him. So obviously congratulations uh, to Evans' uh, first pole for uh, Jaguar. Yeah, for, and, and you know, he's had one podium before, so I mean, it's just a fantastic effort from, from the whole team. Um, you know, this late in, in the season. And I think it's really upset the apple cart, you know, because we were all expecting, you know, Verne and Bird and Degrassi and Buemi up there. Now, all of a sudden, Mitch Evans, who hasn't led a race and hasn't started from pole position, and he's got to go out there and, and lead these guys. So it, it's going to be quite interesting going into that, that uh, first What corner. do you think it is that he did right? You know, when you, when you hook up a lap, um, especially on, on street circuits, it's just so precise. And, and you really have to have as, as little um, wheel spin as possible because um, the surface is so completely uneven. So if you, if you just lift up a little bit, you can lose a tenth here or half, half a tenth. And he, he got it significantly. I mean, he was over a, a tenth of a second faster than anybody else. So he really put in a, a sublime lap. Another point to note is uh, Lopez, and he got that penalty. Yes, he got a penalty, and, uh, you know, in, in Formula E, they have different kinds of penalties. So, I mean, he's dropped down from fifth to, to eighth position, um, and you don't want to see that. Verne, I know, was under inspection um, about a penalty as well, but they seem to have kept him. I mean, he's, he's down in 17th as it is. So, you know, you've got to abide. Laws and, and rules are there in, in all forms of motorsport, and, if, you know, if you break them, you suffer. You do, and uh, Buemi, the local favourite, uh, up in seventh. Is that a surprise? I expected him to be a little bit bit higher, um, but these these shootouts are just so unpredictable, and I think it's really, really fascinating the way that they do it in, in Formula E. You have a free practice one, a free practice two, a qualifying session, and and basically the way that they do it is they just put all of the, the names in a hat, and they go, okay, first five go out, second five, um, uh, third, third five, uh, fourth five. Uh, f four at a time and then from there they take the top five of, out of those categories bang and they go for a super pole so it's just the luck of the draw and um, you know Buemi just got caught out a little bit uh, a little bit short well as intense as uh, Formula E is uh, the title contenders uh, do take some time off 
like swans on the water, calm on top and paddling like crazy underneath. Coming into the Zurich Ypres, the Tyson contenders have little time to relax as their attention is being pulled in every direction. If we have a big boat here, that could be our hospitality. Let's go in the pool there later. There is a pool? Everybody's yeah, like these pools. Oh, let's go, yeah? Three, two, one. Can you say just go? I will. Social media antics, interviews, photo sessions, racing weekends for the points leaders are filled with much more than just racing. Rock and roll, baby. Every driver deals with the pressure in their own unique way. You've been watching Formula E's bad drawing. <laughs> they are getting busier and busier, more demands, more demands for media, less time with the team because you're being tracked here, there and everywhere, but it means I'm doing something right. Do you have any bread? Hey, Jeff. So, will a certain bird be ruffling Jeff's feathers this weekend? The media schedule I have is yeah, a bit bigger than usual, but you know, it's part of the job. I saw many Formula One journalists coming to this race, not even going to Montreal. Uh, so, you know, it's nice to see the, the interest Formula E brings in uh, motorsport worlds in general. Right, looking at each other. But I don't see Sam, where is Sam? Oh, here we go. Short jokes. <laughs> Both of our noses, actually, like a... Like Mine, a, too? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, mathematically, the championship can be one here. You know, a lot of people like to talk about it. It doesn't change anything for me. I'm just here to do, uh, you know, to have fun, first of all, and uh, try and do the best race I can. It's not like we are going to fight with our fist on the track. We are good friends outside the track, and on track, we are two racing drivers that respect themselves. <laughs> So really moody. They're not going to get us moody. No. He has a 40-point uh, buffer, so he's got an enormous buffer. He can't afford to rest too easy, but, you know, he's got a weekend and a half head start on myself, so I've got to attack here. He doesn't necessarily need to, although knowing Jeff, he'll, he'll want to. Um, it's time to put some pressure on. All right, we'll do one series. <laughs> oh! <laughs> We've had four front rows, missed out four times, really, really close. I mean, I think he's had four front rows and they've all been pole positioned. So we're going to go Jeb hunting this weekend and then we'll take it to New York. And we know what happened in New York last time. Two wins and a pole position. So I need some more of that. Damn it. Being stressed or nervous uh, will not help me. So I find it more useful to be calm and just uh, keep doing what I know. Good, mate. We're done. Thanks, mate. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I paid you good money to put him in the water. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it is important for them to take a break now and again. Yeah, and well, listen, also, they, they finish in the end of July. Most of them are European-based, the, the, the drivers. So uh, then they, they have their whole of uh, August and September as a summer holiday, yeah. and then they'll probably get back into to training for uh, the December start of the next season. But how hectic is the life of a typical... Uh, Formula E driver. I think it's getting more and more hectic. Uh, you listen to Sam Bird there mm. saying, you know, all of a sudden they're spending less time with the teams. They're doing a lot more PR work, and and it just shows you that there's a lot more interest uh, coming into into the sport. A lot more sponsors coming on board. The sponsors want a little bit more from the the drivers as well. So um, I, it's gaining a lot more um, credibility and a lot more fans. You know, BMW coming at the end of this year. Mercedes coming next year. Porsche also looking to come in next year as well. So um, there's a lot of interest, you know, a lot of, a lot of big players. You know, you've got manufacturers in there and that's, that's what counts. So we have uh, 10 teams currently? Yeah, we've got 10 teams currently. I don't know what, if they will allow uh, maybe up to 13 teams. I think that would be the maximum 26 drivers mm -hmm. on, on, on the grid. There afterwards, it get, does get a little bit more complicated. But as with any form of motorsport as well, you have teams there that might disappear in a in a season or two so well, teams that might work together or, or they'll they'll come in and then you know mercedes or, or porsche or, or bmw might come in and just take over a team now we we talk a little bit about uh, technology obviously jaguar their first podium wasn't expected um how much of it is attributed to to the driver and how much of it is the actual car 
Well, I, I, a lot of it has got to be um, with the driver. You know, you, you've got to, you, you do have a handful of drivers in that series that, that you're most probably going to rate a little bit higher than, than the others. But, but take nothing away from the teams. Don't forget, they get a, a specific requirement from Formula E, and then they're afterwards. They're allowed to um, work in the gearbox, they're allowed to work in the inverters, and they're allowed to work in their own motor. The only thing they can't change is power mm. um, delivery or the power a amount. So how it gets delivered is, is up to the team. So what Jaguar have done uh, is, a, is a great job, just as all of the other teams um, as well. So, you know, well done to them. That's about the question that everybody asking. Is Formula E the new era in motorsport? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a different era of, of motorsport. But, you know, as I said right in the beginning, Hugo, the world has to change. You know, we can't carrying on using plastics all of the time and destroying our oceans. We mm -hmm. can't uh, carry on using, you know, strange fuels all, all, of, all of the time. So the world has to look at our planet and say, how do we make it a little bit more efficient? I'm not saying that Formula E is going to be the pinnacle of, of motor racing. You know, in the bigger scheme of things, you know, how, how detrimental is Formula One compared to a jumbo jet flying? Mm. Zero. So how do we change everything? If, if the elect electric and battery technology becomes so brilliant and so genius, who knows that in, in you know, uh, another generation from now, the aeroplanes that we fly in aren't electric. That's a massive difference. And I think this is where we're trying to get to, is to get this battery technology and electric technology into something very, very clever. And just to go back to that discussion that uh, you had with the CEO of, uh, of Formula E, he talked about the possibility of uh, other destinations for Formula E on the continent outside of uh, Morocco? You know, I think Africa and Morocco uh, is just stunning up there as well. You know, they, they also got a long history in terms of motor racing. For uh, a country like South Africa, Formula E, how much sense does it make? It would be great to have it as a, as a series to go and watch it. But we have massive cities and our distances between places are so huge. You know, how, um, how, how beneficial is it to have um, that many electric cars within South Africa. I'm not saying that it's not it's not viable, mm. but I don't know if it, you know, traveling from Johannesburg to Pretoria, just for example, is an incredible distance um, that you have to go, just as a lot of the other cities in, in Africa as well. So, you know, to motor racing, any anything that we get in South Africa um, or any other part of Africa would be terrific. You know, we are starved of it. The whole continent. Yeah, Sebastian Bumi is uh, the local favourite, so we are going to find out a little bit more about him. The feeling of having a home race is, is unbelievable. I, I never experienced it in the past. You know, uh, people like Jeb or Daniel, they had the home race. For me, it's very different and I'm gonna try to enjoy as much as I can. I'm really proud and, and hopefully, you know, uh, the weekend will go well. I really think that we've got all the ingredients to do uh, something great. The location is amazing, close to the lake. When you look at the, the pit garages, when you look at the hospitality, the track itself, you know, we've got everything to have a good race. And now we just need to make sure we manage to, to produce a good show. It feels great to be the one championship, the one competition that is really making history, bringing racing back to this country. The ban comes from the accident in Le Mans uh, in uh, 1955. So many people died and then Switzerland decided that motor racing would not be allowed anymore. And that a country is ready to accept changing the law to welcome back motor racing because it's electric, that is a great, great uh, symbol. Formula E is the message of sustainability, technology and innovation. And I think Zurich, fits perfectly in. On the pit lane where we stand, everything in wood, everything sustainable. It's actually very impressive what my team here accomplished. We've never seen anything like this. These pit buildings, these garages, these hospitalities. The venue is going to be incredible. It sets a new standard for Formula A. The ticket sold out in half an hour online. Maybe 150,000 people around the track. And also we have great partners here. Four of our partners from Switzerland. So that makes it even better. Mobilizing the public in the middle of the city, bringing young people, mature people all together to see this exciting technology at the center of Zurich. And it just demonstrates how forward-looking the city of Zurich is. 
The media lounge was actually very great. It was actually massive. I mean, we had about 100 media people, which is for Switzerland, a massive amount of media. Driving with me on the street was a brilliant idea. The people love it. It's just great for Zurich. Media attention was huge. We've always had, you know, lots of people interested in general motorsport. We've had great drivers. Having a Swiss driver here on this race, it's actually great. And I'm an absolutely fan from him, and I hope he's going to win. We had a French winner in Paris, we had a German winner in Germany. We should have a Swiss winner here. I thought I was joking with Sebastian. So, you know, it will be a great thing for the crowd here in Switzerland to have a Boemi be up there. This season so far has been a, a bit disappointing for us as a team, for myself. Uh, we were expecting more, we were used to, to better, but um, Somehow, you know, sometimes we lacked a little bit of pace or we did some small mistakes and, and at the end of the day now we are P5 in the championship, three or four points away from P3, so let's say a podium finish in the championship is still more than possible. Having a good result here would be amazing, you know, if I had to win one race and only one in the season it would definitely be Zurich for me. I'm not going to predict anything, I'm just going to stick to doing my job the best I can and then on Sunday night we see where we are. So Mark Christian is on the boat. It wasn't going very fast, was put in slow motion. Is it probably because he was breaking speed limits here? <laughs> well, he, you know, he's a racing driver. He was probably got the, the, the chief um, boatmaster going, hey, hey, slow down, slow down. But uh, I think it's just exciting for, for Buemi. Um, I mean, he's Swiss, Swiss born. He did spend a lot of his life actually living in, in Bahrain. But um, it's just so exciting, it's a home race, and it just means means that so much. And there's two of them as well, you know, um, two Swiss Swiss drivers there. Great for, for Formula E, great for, um, for Switzerland, and, and great for the world. I think very, very important. Yeah. Interestingly, though, he refused to disclose uh, or give any predictions. Yeah, you know, whenever it comes to racing, and I mean, I've had this all my life as well, who do you think is going to win? Who, I, I also hate making those kind of predictions. In, in motor racing, you always say the person who's in the front has always got the best chance. Mm. But you never know what's going to happen at the first corner. You, it's, motor racing is so unpredictable. You, it, you can be 30 seconds in the lead and crash. You know, It just is so unpredictable. You don't count anything until you cross over that finishing line. So how much is, is unknown or what, is, what are some of the things that are potentially uh, unexpected or could happen at the start of a race or during the course of a race? Well, especially the start of the race. You know, in Formula E, they have um, cold tyres, cold brakes. Going into turn one, there can be uh, accidents. Unfortunately, these things do happen. Um, and that all of a sudden could spin Sam Bird from second or third on the, on the grid down to 15th and everyone moves out of the way and John Eric Verne all of a sudden is in the front. So Verne could win the championship today but it means he has to win the race or the permutations are crazy, you know, but where he's starting, it's going to be very, very difficult. So that can happen at the start of the race. Mechanical, All of a sudden... Mechanical failures, do we well, get much of that? Well, I must say, in, in Formula E, I, I don't know, besides batteries o overheating, one doesn't expect to have me mechanical failures, mm -hmm. um, but they have experienced um, gearbox problems because in the past they've used two gears, three gears, four, uh, up to even five gears um, in a gearbox. And they, those are moving parts, so I mean, that, that can be mm. uh, a bit of a, a problem. Um, batteries over overheating, hitting into a wall, breaking a suspension, of course. So, you know, that, it's racing around a circuit, very, very difficult, uh, a street circuit. Now, would, it, would it talk about uh, the turns uh, on, a, on, a, on, a race, uh, on a race circuit? Mm. And you said they, some of them do as, as, as go as slow as uh, 10, 15 kilometers an hour? Yeah, I mean, there, there's some very tight turns. There's a 90 degree turn, I think turn six. Um, there's a long hairpin going into, into um, uh, the final, uh, I think turn, turn 10 or turn 11 as well. So uh, they know the speed that they can carry into each of those uh, corners. So um, speed is all relative. Uh, you go in as fast or as slow as you can get out on the other side. You don't want to understeer or oversteer into those corners because you don't have runoff areas and if you hit the curbs, uh, you, if you're not going to hit curbs, you're going to hit walls. Well, Yuri is live uh, in the pit lane and uh, we're going to cross over to him and find out what's actually happening on the floor in uh, Zurich. Thank you, Hugo and Sasha. We are here on the grid. It is completely charged and fully electric out here. The atmosphere is getting really hot. Join me for a short walk as we see what's going on here. Let's see who we can talk to. Today was very different, very interesting. 
the drivers are completely shuffled around on as good as we can see this is Lotra's car Lotra's already got his helmet on so we've got no chance of talking to him let's see if we can Lukas good luck Thank you. all the best see you on the other side of the grid when you win this let's go let's go let's go let's go let's go keep on going see who else we can catch here surprising car here this is a dragon this is Jerome D'Ambrosio. D'Ambrosio has managed to, classi to classify his car and put it in fourth after pushing down everybody else that we were expecting in the Super, in a, in a, in a super Bowl. And I mean, for us to understand what the Super Bowl is, and to the viewers that don't know, the, the Dragon Racing team is a fantastic team, but it's not leading in any terms of the points. We'll keep on walking down here. Uh, find out who we can talk to and uh, get some more insight of what's to come on this race. We look at here, this is Prost. Piquet, tudo bem? Só queria falar um minutinho, posso ter? Just to ask you very quickly, how does it look for the race? Your teammate has gone into first. What's going to happen now? I mean, big fan of yours. We want to know what's happening from Africa. So what is the deal? What are you going to push on? Oh, we try our best, like always, you know. Uh, we, our car seems to be good over here. My lap wasn't amazing, so... We have pace to be more in the front, so we're going to be fighting to, you know, try to catch as much as cars as we want, as we can, and try to be in the top five at least. Attacking, right? You're not going to keep uh, the battery power down. You're going to keep going. Well, we'll find a way to get it there. I don't know how it's going to be, but we'll, we'll finish up in the front. You'll do that. Good luck. Good luck for your race. A fantastic, Nick Nelson PK Jr. racing for Panasonic Jaguar. Let's go and see who else is here. This could be Nico Prost, lined up here on the grid, having a short walk. Daniel, how are you doing? Very quick one. In terms of the race, let's walk with you. In terms of your race, what do you think is going to happen for strategy? I mean, uh, your uh, poll in, in, in per se has been a, a bit of a difficult one. But uh, after you win in Berlin, a lot of bets, a lot of uh, hopes and aspirations on you. What are you going to do here in terms of strategy? What do you want to do in the beginning? Run us through. From Africa, we want to know exactly what you think. Um, yeah, it's going to be a tough one, definitely, because it's super hot. So battery, temperature, energy saving is super crucial. We need to really work on that. But, um, yeah, of course, we, st we start a bit down, but we are in a good shape, having a good car, and I'm really confident. Thank you very much, Daniel. Good luck for the race. Daniel Abt uh, telling us about the temperatures. We know that the batteries here are going to be very important. You must remember that these batteries have cells in them, just like your car battery. And if one of them is not working, temperature induced or affected, then we completely lose a big percentage of performance. This has a huge impact on what's going down here. We've got Mr. Jean Todd here, just gone past us. Let's look again. Here's Lucas de Grassi's car. We spoke to him a little bit. Our Brazilian who's been supported here by Emerson Fittipaldi, two-time world champion. And as well, we had here Felipe Massa, which we interviewed a while back. Antonio Felix da Costa just went past us now. Let's keep on walking and see what we can do in terms of the grid. I want to catch Nico, but unfortunately, I don't see him here on the grid. Let's carry on walking here. Other cars that we can find. Who can we talk to? Important here to understand that uh, the teams are under complete, complete pressure the end as we see the legendary and once again mr fittipaldi two-time world champion incredible incredible lined up in front of daniel apt and uh, this is his car number 66 so completely difficult to see how his race is going to unfold he's a championship uh, contender did very well in berlin made it sure and it dominated the whole race but uh, obviously very difficult let's try see if i can speak to mr alan mcnish uh, team principal of audi Mr. McNish, how are you doing? Very good, how are you? Yuri Zubaida here from Cuesta Sports Africa. Wanting to find out your strategy, your planning. Things went a bit different today. I don't know. We, everyone was just wanting to see the Audis. Lucas de Grassi practiced one, one minute ten, I think he yeah, managed yeah. to pull. So 
what exactly went on? Give us a little bit more information. Uh, to be honest, we've been got, the car's good. They were both happy with the car. Uh, Daniel didn't have a very good run in Q2, uh, sorry, in free practice two because of traffic and all of the incidents yes. at the end. So he didn't get a clear uh, qualifying simulation. And with being in the first group as well, which is the slowest group, then it was difficult for him to come through. But the time he did was superb. The only unfortunate thing is there's eight people in front of him. Uh, Lucas uh, had a better run of it, but the difference is, you know, it's like this. It's Minute. thousands of a second, yeah. whether you get into Super Bowl or not. So now we're fifth and ninth, and we've been in this rough situation before, and we've came through to have some podium positions, so we're, we're looking at the long game in the race, 39 laps. When he says long game, uh, viewers, what he means is he's going to try and get the strategy to uh, p save some battery in the beginning, maybe, and uh, start attacking later on in the race. Is that what I'm seeing or not really? You've got two things here. You can either attack on the first lap and try to make up positions, or then you've got to be patient. And I've got to be honest, I'm not a patient person. And so then you've got to be patient and wait until the end of the stints. And there'll be two stints roughly in about the middle. They'll have the car change. And uh, I would say in the five laps before the end of the race and also before the car change, that's when you'll see some action happening. Thank you very much, Mr. McNish. Appreciate that. You have a good day. Good luck. Alan McNish, uh, team principal of uh, Audi Scheffler, ABT Scheffler. Trying to see here what else we can... Uh, round up to uh, give us some insights and bring to our viewers nothing more and nothing less than the freshest and most professional updates from the grid mahindra here on our left uh, we look at the cars that actually are the slowest we have one of the electro funk djs and here here's the other here's uh nelson pk he's starting out in 11th uh there's his car we spoke to him very briefly uh ex formula one driver now in formula e championship under him but uh in terms of what's going to go down it's completely unpredictable the tires these tires that we see are completely different to what uh, you get in formula one these are multi-weather tires but getting them into the operation the correct operating window is extremely important and this is where the difficulty comes i mean we look at the surface here a street circuit that hasn't been uh, used before we look at tram lines those are completely difficult mitch evans his teammate uh, took a wider line in terms of uh, getting the best times and they made a big advantage so we need to try and do exactly the same with uh, Nelson Piquet see how he finds his breaking points he has to go a bit more aggressive as Alan said uh, uh, maybe in the initial parts of the of the race uh, some preferring to save their power and use it towards the end of the race and that's what we'll do let's go through let's see what else is down here enough of Jaguar Panasonic their maiden pole and their maiden uh, P1, let's say. Uh, let's see if they can keep it. They'll be playing a defensive role. Jaguar man myself do appreciate the technology. Nicky Heidfeld, uh, not seeing much of him this weekend. Uh, some surprises, though, in terms of uh, Sam Bird coming down. We have another Swiss driver here for Team Venturi, the team that uh, Felipe Massa will be joining. This is uh, Mortara. And uh, he's had a fantastic weekend. Him and uh, Sebastian Buemi uh, are at home now. And in terms of the race, will be in front of the crowd. So the support, the fan boost, perhaps going to be an option here for this car. Let's see if that will materialize. Felipe Massa going to join in uh, the later part of the year. Obviously, these cars will change. Here on top of the, of the driver's head, or where the helmet would stay, there's a new halo that comes on in a Gen 2 and uh, this makes a big difference and changes all. Same as in Formula One, FIA standards are across the board. Let's go. You can feel the energy here. No pun intended, or pun intended, whatever way you want to take it. The batteries are fully charged. I'm as cheesy as I can be. And here is uh, Antonio Felix da Costa's car, uh, Neo Racing. Difficult for him to, to find his uh, uh, balance in his car during this. Alex Lynn, who actually had uh, a small shunt in practice one, uh, completely touching the wall, uh, trying to find the best lines across the circuit, and uh, very, very difficult. Uh, um, trying to see here, someone just whispered in my ear that Felipe Massa is around, and if I catch him, he will not escape, but uh, let's keep on walking. Let's see here, another Tachita, and this is the big surprise, everyone. Jean-Eric Verne, uh, the ex-Toro Rosso Formula One uh, driver, 
the person that is the driver that is leading this championship and was uh, the highest bet in terms of uh, the Zurich Grand Prix. You see the dry ice being used a lot. The temperatures are extremely high here in Switzerland, making a big surprise uh, to most of the of the viewers and uh, the crowds here, reaching 30, 36 t uh, degrees on uh, Friday. Today, the highest was about 27 degrees. The batteries on these cars are working perfectly at around 26 degrees. We were told by the technicians earlier in the pits when we uh, tested the first masterpiece of this formula uh, that the temperature that is ideal is 26 degrees. The batteries, either hotter or colder, will not perform at the level that they should, and this will have a direct impact on uh, the acceleration of these cars and obviously the life of these cars. Qualifying exhausted all of this. Let's go through to the guys at the back, see what we can find uh, here. In terms of the Neo drivers, we've got Filippo. We've got another Venturi driver, but I do not see Felipe Massa. Uh, let's walk back, let's walk back. Follow me and let's walk back. Let's walk back. Um, oh, he's available here, hold on, hold on. Hold on, available, right? Let's try and see if we can have a quick look at Felipe here. Felipe is going to have to do a very, very different kind of strategy, maybe depending on uh, coasting initially, seeing how he can save uh, for an attack at a later stage during the Grand Prix, uh, saving his battery for as long as possible. Two gears, never know. Uh, let's see what is, what is possible. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. All right, let's go back down here. Let's go back, let's go back. Let's walk back through the pits, where the action all is, where it's all happening. We can feel these grandstands coming into the driving atmosphere here on the tarmac. I'm trying to look around and see who I can get for you guys in terms of Alex Lynn. This was a big disappointment, Alex Lynn, who is now also racing in the GT series for Aston Martin performing quite well in that aspect. Formula E may be the end of his season in New York. We've got the double header, meaning a Saturday race and a Sunday race, a chance for the drivers to maximize on their points. But uh, not an easy, not an easy Grand Prix. Not gonna be easy at all. Let's try and see, here's Nicky Heidfeld. Let's see if we can get a word in with, uh, with uh, Nicky quickly. Nicky. How are you doing? I'm fine, how are you? Very good, very good. Wanting to see what is uh, your plan for today. We saw that it was a bit difficult in terms of uh, the, the, the practice sessions and going through. But strategy-wise, what are you planning to do? What is your initial attack? Plan of attack, let's say. I will not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. But now it's, it's quite difficult here um, because it's relatively hot. And the circuit layout also makes the batteries heat up quite quickly. So um, this is probably the most extreme we've had in a long time, and that makes strategies uh, even more, more difficult if we go a bit longer or shorter. Even now, now as I told you, I will not tell you exactly what we do, but it's still uh, pretty open. We have not decided firmly on what we're going to do. Sorry. And uh, we might change it uh, while we're going. No, don't worry. I didn't want to know your plan. I'm thinking of ghost following you on the app and uh, driving behind you and see if I do the same times, but I doubt it. In reality, wanting to see what do you think of this circuit in terms of, I mean, you're an experienced driver, you've been Formula One, Formula E, and a whole of other, other racing uh, categories. How do you think this circuit was designed and uh, everyone is on the same field here? We're starting, it's afresh. I love it and I live nearby and Zurich is such a fantastic city. I think it's the best venue, venue and the best location we've had so far. Also, uh, I think it's probably the most people around the circuit we've ever seen in, in Formula E. Uh, something that could be even better is the bumps that we have here on the start finish straight and on the back straight. But this is hopefully something they can sort out for next season. Let's keep you off those bumps and make sure that you bring us a, a, a good win or something. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Good man. Good man. Good man. Nice one. Getting Nicky Heifeld, bringing some Formula One experience into this. Uh, who else did we not catch? Nelson Piquet over there, but we've spoken to him already. Let's see. Who else? What else? We saw Naomi Campbell at uh, some superstar celebrity power here. People think that only uh, we have attention from uh, uh, stars. 
Uh, let's see if we get a, a word in with Rose. No. Okay. Rose, let's see if we can get a word in with Rosenquist here. Uh, team Mahindra, very good team uh, in terms of the drivetrain performing very nicely. Uh, difficult for them. Too many pictures here. Let's go. Time to go. Felipe again. <laughs> Enjoying Felipe. But uh, did you catch him? Did you see him? Um, we already interviewed him. You guys will get uh, the info. But here's another fellow Portuguese man, Pedro Lamy. How is everything going? No, 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 Pedro Isota. I'm Italian, man. Isota. My apologies. How's it going? How's it going? Everything oh, going well? Good, they're good. Uh, everything is great. What are your expectations here for Switzerland? I think we will have a great show. Today it will be an amazing event. Uh, Zurich has done a really amazing job for the track. We have um, so many spectators. And maybe the weather will change during the race, so we'll make it things even more interesting. No rain, though. That's the thing. You know, we've got the rain tires, but we want to see a little bit more of action. I know. The, with rain, we will have it. But uh, anyway, we'll have a good show for sure. Pedro, thank you very much. You have a good one. Had him twisted there. Italian, Portuguese, same thing, different day, but uh, obviously not. Italy leading in terms of the manufacturing of these uh, special automobili. automobili. Sasha will be able to cover the rest on there. As we see Naomi Campbell here with uh, the home uh, supported driver, Sebastian Buemi. The stars, as we mentioned, uh, that fill the grid. Not only Formula One, but Formula E also brings the exact entertainment, brings all the action. Yep, yep, yep. Different thing. It's uh, becoming a jungle out here. Difficult to navigate. Let's come and see from the front. Let's see what she's doing. Maybe she's jumping in the car. Maybe she's driving. Let's get Naomi Campbell from the front. Fantastic presence here. Saw her earlier. <laughs> Naomi, we've been told to stay away. Let's see where she is going. Big security around there, carrying her bag. And that's what happens. You have to brake check and pump it. Let's not follow her too close. As we look at the fantastic dragon here, this is Jerome D'Ambrosio. Had a chance to chat to him earlier today. He's performing magnificently today. So a Super Bowl fourth position. I mean, chucking everyone else. And it just shows you that it's all about being flawless. Mr. Alan Prost, can I have one minute? Just to ask you a quick question. In terms of your son, uh, Nico, how is it going to happen now performing on the Formula E? You've left. Are you still involved with Renault? Renault, Nissan coming in for the next season. Yes. Give us a little bit more for Kwesi Africa. You know more or less everything. You know, as uh, Renault is going to leave and Nissan is going to replace, it's, uh, it's the same group. So we are still working well together. For Nicola, I don't think he's going to stay in, uh, in the team, and, uh, but he would like to stay in Formula E. So we, it's a different, different situation, but uh, all good. All, uh, we, wanted to, all right. we wanted to see more of you, and that's what we want to see. Well done. Thank you. Sasha, I think we're done here. Uh, Hugo, Sasha, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Back to you in studio. Take care. Enjoy the race. Great man, Yuri. Thanks very much. Uh, clearly, keeping us uh, keeping tabs on everything uh, that's going on there, including some of the stars and uh, the lovely Naomi Campbell. Pity you didn't get a chance to speak to her. You know, that was just so <laughs> terrific. It was wonderful, brilliant job there from uh, Yuri going up and down the pit lane of Formula E. Give us an idea. Uh, it, it seems also they've been well coached. They, they're far more uh, approachable Receptive. than than Absolutely. yeah. You're right. Absolutely. And just right. wonderful. The one thing I have noticed though on the cars. Um, the numbers are easily visible, but the, the names are not there. I don't, you can't see who, which car it is, unless, you know, when I watch Formula One, I always know them by their helmets, so mm. I'd have to learn uh, the helmets. Um, so I didn't see the names there, but uh, just fabulous. It's such a great atmosphere. You can see everyone's really excited about today's I mean, you, race. You, you talk, Sash, about uh, helmets and, and apparel. Is, is apparel the same in Formula E as it is in F1? Uh, yeah, 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 very much, uh, you know, uh, how, how it is. So... Um, yeah, I mean, they're very, very similar in that, in that regard, yeah, very much so. Something else that, uh, that we picked up was the race and the batteries. Are we going to have a slow race? There is talk that it is extremely hot, and that's going to have an impact on the batteries. And uh, Daniel Att, 
he, he talked about the batteries and how they would try and preserve the life of the batteries. Very much so. And the same with Nick Heifel as well. Wouldn't give too much away on the strategy. But if you look at it very, very carefully, um, it, it's so hot and they're going to be right on each other all of the time. Who's going to actually back off? And then hopefully later, once everyone starts pitting, go in and put in a couple of big laps. It's going to be an interesting race. Yeah, well, there were other things like the dry ice. We certainly would like to talk, to, talk about that uh, in a moment. Right now, we take a detailed look at the circuit. Welcome to ABB Formula E from here in Zurich. Let's go for a lap of this 2.46 kilometer track. It's a long, bumpy start-finish straight with heavy braking into the right-hander of Arboretum Park. The driver is trying to carry as much speed as possible over the hump at the apex of the corner and unusually the tram lines which follow it. Out of Arboretum Park, be careful to avoid the tram lines as these will have less grip than the asphalt that surround them. Left across the tram lines at Rotisschloss, a good exit is important because it's a reasonably long straight that follows. We find ourselves at the end of the straight between turns two and three at Stockerstrasse. Unusually for a Formula E track, this is incredibly smooth. So although it's a 90 degree corner, that smoothness is going to allow the drivers to carry a load of speed. We're now into the rhythm section of the track. Time is hard to gain here and easy to lose. Here we are in the tight section between turns four, five and six. Now in Formula E, we're always talking about the walls. There's no runoff area, the walls are right there. Well, at Zurich, to be accurate is even more critical because most of the corners, like turn five for instance, there's no curb. So the closer you can get to this wall, the more grip you're gonna find. But if you get too close, bounce off it, you're gonna end up in that wall. There's one of the walls you want to avoid on the left. It's a short acceleration of bank into Enga. Here we are at the tram stop chicane. Very quick entry, you're gonna be feathering the brakes through there to try and slow the car down and settle it before you make this incredibly tight left-hander followed by the right. You've got to nail that right-hander though and get a really good exit because you're going into one of the longer straights in Formula E. As you head down here, hunting out the smoothest line possible, you've got one thing on your mind, breaking at exactly the right point. Too early and you give away time, too late and you end up down the runoff. The middle of the Mittenkai hairpin is all about setting up for the exit. You're turning and trying to accelerate while the road falls away from you on the exit. As we approach the start finish line, you're going to be over to the left side of the track because we'll be avoiding the pit in. Unfortunately, these huge bumps start to appear. Look at this as it approaches a manhole cover. You're going to want to get out of the way of these. Will that necessitate weaving down the straight to avoid the bumps? Only time will tell. Continuing down the long straight, crossing the finish line, and that is a lap of the Zurich Formula E track. We're moments away. Final thoughts uh, before we cross over live to Zurich. I'm just really, really excited, you know, watching Dario Franchitti explaining it uh, all to us. It's going to be a fabulous, fabulous event. It's going to be a tremendous amount of strategy, and it's all about the championship. So watch out for Sam Bird, watch out for jean eric Byrne. Okay, so this is a historic moment as we cross over to Zurich for the first EPRI race. In fact, the first race of this magnitude in over 60 years, and it promises to be absolutely exciting. Here's Mahindra team. There is Sebastian Buemi, very much the crowd favorite here, racing on home soil in Switzerland. Good luck to all of the drivers. 